Today's episode about the Horton 229 is made possible by the free-to-play game War Thunder. To get started, use the link in the description below to sign up free and get a free premium vehicle. More on this at the end of the video. So there is this story out there that the Horton 229, a German jet from World War II, is a stealth fighter. Now it is, but it really isn't. So let's talk about that. Now before we get started to this, I actually wanted to make this video for over a year now, if not longer. During most of this time, I actually have been sitting on the books and the resources that I need, but if you've been watching me for some time, you know that I want to get my hands dirty in the archives and do some proper research. So I decided to go to the National Archives in Kew, London and look at what they have on the Horton 229. Big thank you here also to my Patreons and my channel members for making such research strips possible. And once I had everything that I needed, well, that's when I finally sat down to make this video. And with that, hello and welcome everyone. Welcome back to Military Aviation History. I am your host Chris and yes, the Horton HO229 is a special aircraft. Its shape is futuristic in 1945 and as a jet, it was cutting edge back in the day. Since the 1970s or so, the mystique around this aircraft has been growing, mainly revolving of course around its supposed stealth characteristics. Type that into YouTube and you'll actually get quite a number of hits straight out saying that this is a stealth aircraft. Uh, put that into Google, same story. Let me just get one thing straight here. I'm already sick and tired of this. I am already sick and tired of me using the word stealth in this video, even though it's only just started, without any context. So before we talk about the plane, quick simplified summary of what stealth actually is. A stealth is a popular term used to describe tools uh, used to reduce the detection of an object such as an aircraft. Stealth is not one item but an assemblage of techniques which make a system harder to find and attack. These can in fact be very crude. Uh, camouflage arguably falls into the wider umbrella of stealth but it is generally omitted because, especially in recent times, the term has been given a very sort of pro-technology bias. Uh, what most people equate to stealth is the reduction of an aircraft's radar profile by purposely designing an aircraft in a given fashion. Coatings, materials and shapes could make objects less easy to detect. Both the U-2 and especially the SR-71 explored these concepts even while putting the primary emphasis on altitude and or speed for survivability. Now for the sake of completion I'll also add that uh, countermeasures to infrared, radio frequencies, even excessive audio profiles and electronic warfare, any sort of active emissions control, well they are also all part of stealth. But that really goes outside the scope of this video. Today well, today when talking about stealth, I am mainly talking about what's known as the radar cross-section or what's abbreviated as RCS. All objects illuminated by radar will reflect energy to some extent. The radar cross-section is a parameter denoted by sigma used to characterize the scattering properties of a radar target. It represents the target size as seen by the radar and has the dimensions of square meters. RCS area is not the same as physical area, but a measure of the target's ability to reflect the radar signals in the direction of the receiving antenna. Two of the main tools to lower the chance of detection are scattering and absorption. An example is the use of radar absorbent coating on aircraft to weaken the returning signal or altering the shape of an aircraft in such a way as to deflect incoming radar waves. If you want to stretch all of this, you could say every single plane is stealthy, just in different ways to each other, depending on their relative detectability or that uh, no plane really is stealthy because all of them have some sort of return that could, in theory, be detected. You cannot hide an aircraft completely. You can get very close depending on your system and of course on the detection system and you can act as if you are pretty much invisible in many scenarios. 
But stealth is more than that. The object of a stealth platform must be, first, to prevent detection, but next, to prevent recognition on the basis of the relevant observables. So yes, I could say that compared, for example, to a B-17, the H-0229 is a stealth aircraft. Probably. I actually don't know the rate of return of either aircraft to make an empiric statement about that, so just take that as an educated guess. But how and in what way a B-17 compares to a 229 is completely irrelevant. In practice, and that's really what matters, those planes that significantly reduce their chance of detection and are, they are specifically built to do so uh, with passive and active means incorporated in them are considered to be stealth aircraft. Before we continue this, the purpose of this video is not at all to compare the Horton 229 with other aircraft or to show you that it is not in fact stealthy. I really don't like using that word by the way like this but uh, hey there's no other way. I don't have the data to do any of that because there is no data to do any of that which in itself as we will see should give us a question or should make us question really blanket statements such as that the Horton 229 is a stealth aircraft. What I want to show you is what is known about the aircraft, how the story about its stealth characteristic developed and once you are equipped with that knowledge you can then make your own verdict on the whole matter. So how did this story about the Horton 229 being a stealth fighter start? Well, largely due to the uh, convenience, really, of its similarity to existing stealth aircraft like the B-2. The flying wing layout was found to have the smallest possible vertical plane areas and hence the least radar reflecting surface, while its simple shape precluded the reflection of the incoming electromagnetic waves in the direction of the signal source, the searching radar. Stealth warplanes such as the Northrop B-2A appear to have design features strikingly reminiscent of the Horton H0229. No wonder that the astounding idea of Nazi stealth arose and became almost universally accepted by the media. Critical in my view of the Horton's prominence in the public eye was also a documentary aired on a US American TV channel back in the uh, 2000s. I personally don't think it was a very good documentary. In fact, I think it was rather misleading, but that's just my opinion. Uh, in any case, uh, in most of the discussions I see on the internet, invariably I will run into people who seem to cite information out of this documentary that they have just taken at face value. Now, before we go into this, uh, we're gonna have a quick look at today's sources. In the archives, of course, in the National Archives in the UK, I found, for example, a summary drafted by the British on all the Horton birds in October 1945. It's probably the most exhaustive summary of all the life's work of the Horton brothers, or especially Rima Horton, really, just after the war. And I also found a summary of interviews of the Horton brothers themselves. Uh, there was also one intelligence sighting from October 1944 that pertains to the uh, Horton 229. And uh, the message, and I, I'm not making this up, if you want you can check the file again if you know, yourself when the archives open, but it reads, Petrodactyl seen operating at Göttingen, span estimated 80 to 100 feet. And this is just why I love going through the archives. You know, the stuff you find, it's, it's just amazing. And I hope, of course, that's also why you like the channel because, well, I go to archives and I do this kind of research for the channel. Now, because of the rules with uh, commercial use of the images that I take at archives, I can't really show pictures here. But go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'll check the rules again and maybe I can post some of the, uh, the files that I uh, took uh, pictures of there in the coming days. Um, no guarantees, I'll just have to check again. Then there is a study written by the Smithsonian on the analysis, on their analysis of the only surviving 229 and also a study by Northrop Grumman that plays a role in this video. And of course, then there's also this book by uh, Shepelev and Ottens with the very straightforward title Horton H0229. It's pretty good. Uh, but the most complete study of Reimer Horton's life must be Only the Wing by Russell Lee. 
it's currently out of print and let's just say it's very hard to come by. So when I actually went to get myself a copy, I was confronted by this. Yeah, I got myself a copy. Uh, I managed to get this via a local library. There's no way I could actually have afforded that price, but I have been in contact with the author and it seems like this book might get a reprint. So for those people who are interested, that is something worth keeping your eyes on. Uh, for the rest of the sources, of course, you can check out the description as always. Talking about the Horton's radar detectability then, we have to talk about three different aspects. Aspect number one, the context to Reimer Horton's claims that the Horton 229 was stealthy. Aspect number two, the material used in the Horton 229. And then of course, aspect number three, the flying wing itself. After the war, Reimer did not have much luck in getting a job. While many of his colleagues went, for example, to the United States or found employment somewhere, Reimer Horton's chances well of employment in the US or in the UK quickly faltered. Uh, Reimer Horton was and remained, how shall I say this? He remained an outsider really. He came from an enthusiast, self-taught background and he didn't get his PhD until after the war. And he always, to the end of his days, really maintained that he and his ideas weren't taken seriously because, well, he lacked academic credentials. The British and Americans might have understood Reimer's accomplishments if they had flown and evaluated the various Horton aircraft immediately after the war. For a time, the Allies seemed eager to do so, but during the final months, marauding Allied troops and displaced persons had destroyed nearly all of them. Over the course of one month, however, interest in doing so peaked at the highest level before fading to nothing. Of course, he did get some offers after the war, but these were retracted quite quickly, uh, not due to his credentials, mind you. In the UK, for example, companies that wanted to employ Horton had been negotiating with him, were threatened by a mass strike from their staff, lest they had to work with a German. For most of his post-war life, Reimer was stuck in Argentina, where he initially led a modestly good life, although it never really improved. But for all intents and purposes, he was stuck at the end of the world. And I don't mean this as a slight to Argentina, they actually had quite a vast and important aeronautical program, but he was outside of the aeronautical circles that really mattered internationally, those that were in the US, in the Soviet Union or in Europe. And it's here now, completely outside of those circles, that he suddenly starts publishing claims about the Horton 229. Later in his life, Weimar Horton's aviation career was faltering. Possibly as an attempt to bolster his reputation, he promoted the idea that Horton HO 229V3 was intended to be built as a stealth aircraft, which would have placed this jet's design a decade ahead of its time. One of Reimer's first claims that the Horton had some sort of stealth in it came in 1950 when he published an article in the, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, in the uh, Revista Nacional de Aeronautica, an Argentinian aeronautical magazine. There, in that article, he claimed the wooden construction of the 229 was key in getting the plane a stealth character. Because the electrical wave reflection is good for metallic surfaces, said Horton. However, in wood surfaces, the reflection of these waves is small, in as so much as these are hardly visible on radar. Let's talk about this specific claim then, and thus turn to aspect two, the materials used in the 229. There is this idea floating around in uh, some circles that well, wood automatically makes a plane stealthy. That's not the case. Uh, it's been especially gaining popularity the last sort of 10 years, I would say. But it also, for example, pops up with the De Havilland Mosquito from time to time. However, it's one of those things that just doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. Here it should be noted that despite the widespread belief, the wooden construction of an aircraft does not necessarily reduce its radar visibility. Known is the fact that the all-wooden de Havilland Mosquito was in no way invisible. 
It is true that wood is predominantly radar transparent material, reflecting and dissipating only a small fraction of radiation. But with the skin transparent to the radar rays, the inner structures such as the engines or the tubular frame of the H0229 would reflect the incoming radiation nonetheless. Now wood does interact with radio waves differently to metal, of course it does, but that doesn't mean much in itself. This, this idea that wood is sort of this magical ingredient sounds really cool if it were true, but it's not. Because if it was, pretty much the whole Soviet Air Force during World War II would have been a stealth fleet. And German radar really had no problem in picking those guys up. But and both, by the way, I mean, what applies to wood also applies to plywood. Um, to get a bit more technical here, wood in itself does reflect radar waves differently to metal. Of course it does. Um, and a lot can impact this from the density of the wood over to, for example, the frequency of the radar being used. But overall, wood will still reflect. And someone I know actually made a really great analogy on this by saying that the, you know, imagine you're shining a light at a car or a mirror. There is going to be light that is going to be reflected back, but it's going to reflect differently, right? And that's essentially the analogy that you can use there. Reimar, in the 1980s, started talking about his choice of wood again. Reimar claimed that he had specifically used wood to build a substantial portion of the airplane because the aircraft would not reflect radar energy. He recalled that technicians sandwiched 12 mm of charcoal, sawdust and glue between two 1.5 mm thick sheets of plywood before using this composite material to skin the wings. Now, as we will see, there is no evidence currently available to us to confirm this. On the topic of his building materials, it is more likely that Reimer used wood because, well, that's all he had and all he knew. This project was only running because his brother managed to siphon off funds and materials and some men even from the rice industry in a completely, totally illegal endeavor and the Horton brothers had no factory or industrial plant. They had to rely on another company, Goffa, to build this machine. And for the second prototype, for example, they, they used the tail wheel of a destroyed Heinkel HE-177 bomber as their front wheel and repurposed the aircraft, the Heinkel's aircraft uh, hydraulics. They didn't have anything else. The Horton brothers were, well, they were scrounging up what they could find and did so for many, many years. Then we come to Reimer's next claim that he wanted to use a special mixture to reduce the plane's radar signature. In 1983, Reimer Horton wrote in Nurflügel that he had planned to combine a mixture of sawdust, charcoal and glue between the layers of wood that formed large areas of the exterior surface on the H09 jet wing to shield, as he said, the whole airplane from radar because the charcoal should absorb the electrical waves. Under the shield, then also the tubular steel airframe and the engines would be invisible to radar. Remember here that Reimar claimed he did this to absorb electrical waves. That'll be important at the end of this video. Now, following, of course, the public interest in the matter, the Smithsonian, well, they sat down and they wrote a proper paper about the aircraft they had in their care, looking for evidence of this mixture. It's called the Technical Study of the Batwing Fighter. This was written by six researchers and uh, published in 2014 by Lauren Horlick, the conservator at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. The stealth myth has been growing since the 1980s and was invigorated by the National Geographic Channel in collaboration with Northrop Grumman produced a documentary called Hitler's Stealth Fighter in 2009. The program featured the Horton H0229 V3 as a potential wonder weapon that arrived too late in the war to be used. The documentary also referred to the jet storage location as a secret government warehouse, which added to the mystique of this artifact. In fact, this warehouse is the Smithsonian Institution's Paul E. Garber facility in Suitland, Maryland, where a team of conservators, material scientists, a curator, and aircraft mechanic have been evaluating the aircraft. Now in that study, they analyzed the plane's building materials, 
by taking really small sort of samples of the aircraft structure and then examining those through various means. Reimer Horton stated that he wanted to add charcoal to the adhesive layer of the plywood skin, but as we discovered, there are two adhesive layers used to form the plywood skin. Despite our best efforts to either validate or debunk Reimer Horton's claim, the fact remains that we have a dilemma of scale in pursuit of identifying this material. The problem of looking for something tiny, like charcoal particles, within something huge, like a jet, is that it opens the door for speculative thoughts about looking and sampling in the right or wrong location. We characterized a material within the plywood adhesive that shares many commonalities with charcoal, but is not clearly and definitively charcoal. Based on the model we have in the Smithsonian, uh, Reimer Horton's claim, well, it cannot be verified. This might also be because, well, this is a prototype. V3 was a prototype. It's in the name. And perhaps he had plans to use charcoal in the main production variants, but that is pure speculation at this point. At a similar juncture, the Smithsonian actually concludes that Reimer Horton's published statement in the 1980s about wanting to add charcoal to the production model must be taken at face value as an idea. A production model was never fabricated and the prototype does not show any clear evidence of charcoal as a stealth ingredient. It is not clear when Reimer first had this idea. He first published it in 1983. Why not in 1950 or when he was trying to make himself more attractive to the Allied companies post-war? Now it is possible that the brothers were, well, developing some sort of adhesive or mixtures out of those materials that they cited. But there is no evidence that this was done for, for stealth. If it did help, it would have been a lucky coincidence. They probably weren't even aware of it. I don't think they would have been unhappy if they were less likely to be picked up by a radar, but at that time I don't think it was a big concern of theirs. They were more concerned about having a glue that would stick together and their planes would not delaminate. Beyond that, I think it's probably also something I said earlier, and that is that he didn't have anything but wood and these makeshift adhesives to build his aircraft in the first place. Although the presence of charcoal as a stealth ingredient appears unlikely, the opportunity to investigate the adhesive matrix revealed a microcosm of additives and inclusions, which can be seen as an artifact of materials availability at the time. All of the results from the technical study provided insights to the material choices of the Goffa workshop, which speak to an economy of wartime availability, along with an unusual combination of experimental and traditional material use. This is where I turn to the last aspect, the flying wing itself. The 229 was designed as a flying wing from the outset. And I will argue that this was done with absolutely no regard to stealth or its detectability. It stands at the very end. Although, no, actually, no, it doesn't stand at the very end. It stands at the end, but not the very end of Reimer Horton's obsession with flying wings. He was uh, certainly not the first one to come up with such designs. That's a myth. I don't know where it comes from, but that is often repeated and it's not true. Depending on how we look at it, the first flying wings were actually drawn up even before World War I, were even flown before World War I, and quite a few concepts were trials before the 1930s when Horton started out. But while Reimar wasn't the first, not even in Germany, mind you, he became an absolute fanatic. Under no circumstances, and I really say under no circumstances would he compromise. When it was pointed out, for example, to him that the HO229 had extreme problems with oscillation and control at certain speeds, uh, there's that keyword uh, Dutch roll, you might have heard about it before, he adamantly refused the introduction of a vertical stabilizer. Uh, something actually even his own brother told him to do because they wanted to get this aircraft produced. He thought that he himself could fix the problem without really spoiling his flying wing concept. What I find interesting about Reimar's claims is that he has quite a fixation on the materials used, 
but he never really talks about the shape of the aircraft. He does so on the side really, but the shape really is so, so very important and he doesn't give it enough attention. The primary method for reducing radar cross-section was to shape the aircraft surface so that a deflected radar return in predictable ways. Once the aircraft's basic shape has been designed for lower RCS, a second step is to apply materials to the surface area that further reduce RCS. The Houghton shape might have contributed to the comparatively lower detectability than a uh, similar aircraft at the time. For example, the uh, mission of a vertical stabilizer, the traditional tail arrangement, could have benefited the plane in that regard. As most radar waves impinge on an aircraft at near horizontal angles, vertical surfaces on the aircraft have to be eliminated completely or at least kept to the minimum in order to reduce radar reflections. However, the assumption here that the Horton 229 was designed with this in mind is yet to be proven. Not a single source has been found to this very day to confirm this. And when the possibility of adding a tail to the 229 was raised in Germany by other colleagues and by Reimer's brother himself, because, well, the plane had some problems with control, Reimer flat out refused. But there is no document to show or a testimony to say that Reimer did so because he was concerned about stealth. Instead, he tried to overcome this problem in his own way. The plane was not to have a tail because Reimer was being Reimer, not because it was a stealth issue. This is one of those lucky coincidences where a design built for completely different reasons suddenly has the potential externality no one reckoned with. But remember, just because it's a flying wing doesn't mean it's stealthy. It's not that easy. Making a stealth aircraft is more complex than that. The design is not quite so simple. Any uniformly curved surface would act as part of a sphere and reflect energy randomly, some of it towards the radar side we are trying to avoid. Such a design process could be expected to be, and actually is, very complex and costly. This is one of those cases where just because something looks like something, doesn't mean that is something. Yeah? Just because it looks stealthy doesn't mean it is stealthy. And just because a car looks fast doesn't mean it's fast. It might be a go-kart strapped with a Lamborghini chassis. This single-minded attention to the Horton 229 for its stealth character glosses over the actual accomplishments that Reimer Horton had with the aircraft. The 229 had problems. Its use as a fighting platform is Let's just say it's questionable, considering the control problems that the aircraft had. But it was an engineering feat that deserves to be recognized. While no wartime document is known to confirm any stealth activities within the Luftwaffe, the Horton 229 can in any event be considered a precursor to the latest flying wing, the blended wing body and related developments, both military and civil, stealth or not. The Horton 229 was many things. It was a futuristic design, a beautiful aircraft, a flying wing with jets. All of this really should give us a reason to acknowledge it. It was and remains an aeronautical achievement, an achievement often ignored. In our fascination to try and find something special about this aircraft, the actual work and dedication by Reimar to his life's work of the flying wing is completely cast aside, as is the clandestine but really impressive effort by his brother in pooling resources for this project by finding clever ways to cheat the system. I mean, he really, I mean, Walter was a logistical and bureaucratic genius. But when it comes to stealth, empirical evidence stops short of what some stories would like to make you believe. And really, to be honest, if the Horton brothers were working on something like stealth, why keep it a secret from the Allies? Oddly enough, neither the Horton brothers nor Franz Berger mentioned the RCS techniques applied to the Horton 9 to Allied intelligence specialists immediately after the war, a peculiar omission in light of Reimer's interest in resuming his work. Finally, if the Horton 9 was as speedy as Reimer estimated, 
why would the aircraft need to evade radar detection when it could outrun any Allied fighter? In one of the files I looked at from the National Archives, the Horton 229 is described in quite some detail, as are all of the Horton's other designs. Uh, those are the uh, Farnborough reports, by the way, if, in case you already know them. Uh, any mention to stealth, however, must be really well hidden in the file, because, well, it ain't there. There's also a summary of the interviews with the Horton brothers, and no stealth is mentioned there. Now, I know some people might have, well, might have seen that famous, or well, I should maybe probably say infamous documentary about the Horton 229, uh, where they rebuilt one from scratch, an aircraft model, a one-to-one. -one. The people of Norfolk Grumman built it, and uh, they did a really good job, but the documentary probably had some how shall I call this, unfortunate editing that omitted uh, some of the details. Uh, the model, for example, is representative rather than an exact copy, although this is mentioned in the documentary as well. Uh, and that is also completely normal. But it also means that it uses different materials, which can make a difference. Luckily enough, you don't actually have to rely on the documentary to tell you the details of Norfolk Grumman's study because the engineers wrote a proper paper themselves. It's called Aviation Archaeology of the Horton 229 V3 Aircraft. A full-scale RCS model was fabricated with modern techniques to simulate the aircraft as it would appear to electromagnetic energy. The original aircraft structure was constructed of a steel tube truss design covered by wood skins. The RCS model was constructed of wood to replicate the original design and complex parts were fabricated by modern techniques such as stereolithography. So the plane is a representation, not a copy. Also with reference to the charcoal, the study concludes that the HO229's leading edge has the same characteristics as the plywood except that the frequency do not exactly match and have a shorter bandwidth. This indicates that the dielectric constant of the HO229's leading edge is higher than the plywood test sample. The similarity of the two tests indicates that the design using a carbon black type material produced a poor absorber." End quote. Now it continues, this absorber proved to be unsuccessful and only increased the dielectric constant of the edge. Remember how Reimar in the 1980s said the charcoal mixture was added to absorb electric waves? Well, turns out it doesn't do that and in fact makes matters somewhat worse. The only thing we can definitely say about the Horton 229 will be that it has a lower radar cross-section as some other planes and it will have a higher radar cross-section than others. In that regard, it is stealthier compared to some planes out there. But, come on. That in itself doesn't make it a stealth aircraft. You know, the same argument would hold true to a Cessna. That just shows you how irrelevant that statement is in the first place. Now that brings me to the uh, problem of hindsight. Nowadays, because we have the B2, for example, well, the flying wing design is automatically translated into sort of this conception of stealth. But if we follow such reasoning, we are making assumptions. Really assumptions that do not hold up based on the evidence that we have. One must keep in mind that a pure flying wing configuration with no vertical or horizontal tail surfaces would generally be expected to have a lower radar cross-section as compared to conventional aircraft design. But there is considerable evidence to suggest that such designs were initially pursued because of the inherent aerodynamic properties of the design, not because of stealth. If you look at the story of Reimar's claim, some very basic questions pop up. Where is the evidence, the physical evidence with that I mean, not just anecdotal, that he worked to overcome radar because, well, there must be at least something if he did that. Why, this is the second question, why did he not try to land an immediate job by telling the Allies that he himself had found a way to defeat radar? Then, why did he only come up with these statements piecemeal, really, sort of long after the war, one after the other? And why this focus on stealth and not, for example, the aircraft speed? Because speed would have probably be, well, probably been the 229's best defense, really. Uh, why did he not continue his work on stealth? Why did no one he worked with ever talk about it? Why 
do none of the documents in the archives, uh, at least those I found, describe it? I mean, someone must have talked to get better, better treatment or a job or something. Um, why did Reimar always talk about materials and didn't spend as nearly as much time talking about the aircraft shape when both are important in decreasing RCS? And those would just be sort of the basic questions that come up before anyone scrutinizes even the Horton 229 on display in the Smithsonian or uh, should comment about its stealth character. But if you want to sell a story, questions get in the way. Following the heightened interest in all-wing aircraft after the public unveiling of the USA's Northrop B-2 bomber, imaginative writers considered none of these questions as they extrapolated from the similarity of the B-2 to the H-9 to conclude that Weimar had designed a first stealth aircraft by purposely and deliberately reducing the H-9's jet wing RCS. However, it was regrettable that so many writers concluded, based solely on Reimer's words and without supporting documentary or physical evidence, that he had not only accomplished a similar result more than 40 years earlier, but also purposely designed the wing to evade radar detection. So I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you to Warfunder for sponsoring this episode and providing the footage of the Horton HO229V3 you saw in this video. The Horton 229 is one of the staggering amount of over 1000 planes, tanks and ships currently in the game, which are all designed to look as close to reality as possible. I especially like Warfunder's mixed tank and plane battles because it allows me to give tactical air support to my team and the friends I play with. Nothing is more satisfying than blowing up that tank that's pinning down your allies. Warfunder gives you the option to crew tanks, planes and ships in fast paced and easy to get into action over to a more difficult simulation like game mode. Never mind what your preference is, Warfunder has something for everyone. If you want to fight with or against me, remember to use the link in the description below to sign up for free and get a free premium vehicle. Thank you to Jack for providing one of the books I used. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. Big thank you also to Trent for helping with my questions on Vader. Sources are as always in the description below. And as always, I hope you have a great day and see you in the sky.